Welcome, dear listener, to this evening's audiobook. This reading is brought to you by Sleepy Sounds. Tonight, we will be reading a collection of Chinese fairy tales and short stories. So, as the gentle sound of the soft rain starts to fall, let us begin. The Frog Princess There, where the young Zikyang has come about halfway on its course to the sea, the Frog King is worshipped with great devotion. He has a temple there, and frogs by the thousand are to be found in the neighborhood, some of them of enormous size. Those who incur the wrath of the god are apt to have strange visitations in their homes. Frogs hop about on tables and beds, and in extreme cases, they even creep up the smooth walls of the room without falling. There are various kinds of omens, but all indicate that some misfortune threatens the house in question. Then the people living in it become terrified, slaughter a cow, and offer it as a sacrifice. Thus, the god is mollified, and nothing further happens. In that part of the country, there once lived a youth named Sia Kung Shang. He was handsome and intelligent. When he was some six or seven years of age, a serving maid dressed in green entered his home. She said that she was a messenger from the Frog King, and declared that the Frog King wished to have his daughter marry young Sia. Old Sia was an honest man, not very bright, and since this did not suit him, he declined the offer on the plea that his son was still too young to marry. In spite of this, however, he did not dare look about for another mate for him. Then a few years passed, and the boy gradually grew up. A marriage between him and a certain Mistress Jiang was decided upon. But the Frog King sent word to Mistress Jiang, Young Sia is my son-in-law. How dare you undertake to lay claim to what does not belong to you? Then Father Jiang was frightened and took back his promise. This made old Sia very sad. He prepared a sacrifice and went to his temple to pray. He explained that he felt unworthy of becoming the relation of a god. When he had finished praying, a multitude of enormous maggots made their appearance in the sacrificial meat and wine and crawled around. He poured them out, begged forgiveness, and returned home filled with evil forebodings. He did not know what more he could do and had to let things take their course. One day, young Sia went out into the street. A messenger stepped up to him and told him on the part of the Frog King, that the latter urgently requested Sia to come to him. There was no help for it. He had to follow the messenger. He led him through a red gateway into some magnificent, high-ceilinged rooms. In the great hall sat an ancient man who might have been some eighty years of age. Sia cast himself down on the ground before him in homage. The old man bade him rise and assigned him a place at the table. Soon, a number of girls and women came crowding in to look at him. Then the old man turned to them and said, Go to the room of the bride and tell her that the bridegroom has arrived. Quickly, a couple of maids ran away, and shortly after an old woman came from the inner apartments, leading a maiden by the hand, who might have been sixteen years of age, and was incomparably beautiful. The old man pointed to her and said, This is my tenth little daughter. It seemed to me that you would make a good pair, but your father has scorned us because of our difference in race, yet one's marriage is a matter that is of life-long importance. Our parents can determine it only in part. In the end, it rests mainly with oneself. Sia looked steadily at the girl, and a fondness for her grew in his heart. He sat there in silence. The old man continued, 
I knew very well that the young gentleman would agree. Go on ahead of us, and we will bring you your bride. Saya said he would, and hurried to inform his father. His father did not know what to do in his excitement. He suggested an excuse, and wanted to send Sia back to decline his bride with thanks. But this Sia was not willing to do. While they were arguing the matter, the bride's carriage was already at the door. It was surrounded by a crowd of green coats, and the lady entered the house and bowed politely to her parents-in-law. When the latter saw her, they were both pleased, and the wedding was announced for that very evening. The new couple lived in peace and good understanding. And after they had been married, their divine parents-in-law often came to their house. When they appeared dressed in red, it meant that some good fortune was to befall them. When they came dressed in white, it signified that they were sure to make some gain. Thus, in the course of time, the family became wealthy. But since they had become related to the gods the rooms, courtyards and all other places were always crowded with frogs, and no one ventured to harm them. Sia Kung Shang alone was young and showed no consideration. When he was in good spirits, he did not bother them. But when he got out of sorts, he knew no mercy, and purposely stepped on them and killed them. In general, his young wife was modest and obedient, yet she easily lost her temper. She could not approve her husband's conduct. But Sia would not do her the favor to give up his brutal habit, so she scolded him because of it and he grew angry. Do you imagine, he told her, that because your parents can visit human beings with misfortune, that a real man would be afraid of a frog? His wife carefully avoided uttering the word frog. Hence, his speech angered her, and she said, Since I have dwelt in your house, your fields have yielded larger crops, and you have obtained the highest selling prices. And that is something after all. But now, when young and old, you are comfortably established. You wish to act like the fledgling owl who picks out his own mother's eyes as soon as he is able to fly. Sia then grew still more angry and answered, These gifts have been unwelcome to me for a long time, for I consider them unclean. I could never consent to leave such property to sons and grandsons. It would be better if we parted at once. So he bade his wife leave the house, and before his parents knew anything about it, she was gone. His parents scolded him and told him to go at once and bring her back. But he was filled with rage and would not give in to them. That same night, he and his mother fell sick. They felt weak and could not eat. The father, much worried, went to the temple to beg for pardon, and he prayed so earnestly that his wife and son recovered in three days' time. And the frog princess also returned, and they lived together happily and contented as before. But the young woman sat in the house all day long, occupied solely with her ornaments and her rouge, and did not concern herself with sewing and stitching. So Sia Kung Shang's mother still had to look out for her son's clothes. One day, his mother was angry and said, My son has a wife, and yet I have to do all the work. In other homes, the daughter-in-law serves her mother-in-law. But in our house, the mother-in-law must serve the daughter-in-law. This, the princess accidentally heard. In she came, much excited, and began, have I ever omitted, as is right and proper, to visit you morning and evening? My only fault is that I will not burden myself with all this toil for the sake of saving a trifling sum of money. The mother answered not a word, but wept bitterly and in silence because of the insult offered her. 
her son came along and noticed that his mother had been weeping. He insisted on knowing the reason and found out what had happened. Angrily, he reproached his wife. She raised objections and did not wish to admit that she had been in the wrong. Finally, Sia said, It is better to have no wife at all than one who gives her mother-in-law no pleasure. What can the old frog do to me after all, if I anger him, save call misfortunes upon me, and take my life? So he once more drove his wife out of the house. The princess left her home and went away. The following day, fire broke out in the house and spread to several other buildings. Tables, beds, everything was burned. Sia, in a rage because of the fire, went to the temple to complain. To bring up a daughter in such a way that she does not please her parents-in-law shows that there is no discipline in a house. And now, you even encourage her in her faults. It is said the gods are most just. Are there gods who teach men to fear their wives? Incidentally, the whole quarrel rests on me alone. My parents had nothing to do with it. If I was to be punished by the axe and cord, well and good. You could have carried out the punishment yourself, but this you did not do. So now I will burn your own house in order to satisfy my own sense of justice. With these words, he began piling up brushwood before the temple, struck sparks, and wanted to set it ablaze. The neighbors came streaming up and pleaded with him, so he swallowed his rage and went home. When his parents heard of it, they grew pale with a great fear. But at night, the god appeared to the people of a neighboring village and ordered them to rebuild the house of his son-in-law. When day began to dawn, they dragged up building wood, and the workmen all came in throngs to build for Sia. No matter what he said, he could not prevent them. All day long, hundreds of workmen were busy, and in the course of a few days, all the rooms had been rebuilt, and all the utensils, curtains, and furniture were there as before. And when the work had been completed, the princess also returned. She climbed the stairs to the great room and acknowledged her fault with many tender and loving words. Then she turned to Sia Kung Shang and smiled at him sideways. Instead of resentment, joy now filled the whole house. And after that time, the princess was especially peaceable. Two whole years passed without an angry word being said, but the princess had a great dislike for snakes. Once, by way of a joke, young Sia put a small snake into a parcel, which he gave her, and told her to open. She turned pale and reproached him. Then Sia Kung Shang also took his jest seriously, and angry words passed. At last, the princess said, This time, I will not wait for you to turn me out. Now, we are finally done with one another. And with that, she walked out of the door. Father Sia grew very much alarmed, beat his son himself with his staff, and begged the god to be kind and forgive. Fortunately, there were no evil consequences. All was quiet, and not a sound was heard. Thus, more than a year passed. Sia Kung Shang longed for the princess and took himself seriously to task. He would creep in secret to the temple of the god and lament because he had lost the princess. But no voice answered him. And soon afterward, he even heard that the god had betrothed his daughter to another man. Then he grew hopeless at heart and thought of finding another wife for himself. Yet, no matter how he searched, he could find none who equaled the princess. This only increased his longing for her and he went to the home of the Yuans, to a member of which family it was said she had been promised. There, they had already painted the walls and swept the courtyard, 
and all was in readiness to receive the bridal carriage. Sia was overcome with remorse and discontent. He no longer ate and fell ill. His parents were quite stunned by the anxiety they felt on his account and were incapable of helpful thought. Suddenly, while he was lying there, only half conscious, he felt someone stroke him and heard a voice say, And how goes it with our real husband, who insisted on turning out his wife? He opened his eyes, and it was the princess. Full of joy, he leaped up and said, How is it you have come back to me? The princess answered, To tell the truth, according to your own habit of treating people badly, I should have followed my father's advice and taken another husband. And, as a matter of fact, the wedding gifts of the Yuan family have been lying in my home for a long time. But I thought and thought and could not bring myself to do so. The wedding was to have been this evening, and my father thought it shameful to have the wedding gifts carried back. So I took the things myself and placed them before the Yuan's door. When I went out, my father ran out beside me. You insane girl, he said, so you will not listen to what I say. If you are ill-treated by Sia in the future, I wash my hands of it. Even if they kill you, you shall not come home to me again. Moved by her faithfulness, the tears rolled from Sia's eyes. The servants, full of joy, hurried to the parents to acquaint them with the good news. And when they heard it, they did not wait for the young people to come to them, but hastened themselves to their son's rooms, took the princess by the hand, and wept. Young Sia, too, had become more settled by this time, and was no longer so mischievous. So he and his wife grew to love each other more sincerely day by day. Once the princess said to him, Formerly, when you always treated me so badly, I feared that we would not keep company into our old age. So I never asked heaven to send us a child. But now that all has changed, and I will beg the gods for a son. And sure enough, before long, Sia's parents-in-law appeared in the house clad in red garments. And shortly after heaven, sent the happy pair two sons instead of one. From that time on, their intercourse with the Frog King was never interrupted. When someone among the people had angered the god, he first tried to induce young Sia to speak for him, and sent his wife and daughter to the Frog Princess to implore her aid. And if the princess laughed, then all would be well. The Sia family has many descendants, whom the people call the Little Frog Men. Those who are near them do not venture to call them by this name, but those standing further off do so. Note. Little Frog Men, Watsi, is the derogatory name which the North Chinese give the Chinese of the South on occasion. The End. Jayana the Beautiful. Once upon a time, there was a descendant of Confucius. His father had a friend, and this friend held an official position in the South, and offered the young man a place as secretary. But when the latter reached the town, where he was to have been active, he found that his father's friend had already died. Then he was much embarrassed seeing that he did not have the means to return home again. So he was glad to take refuge in the monastery of Puto, where he copied holy books for the abbot. About a hundred paces west of the monastery stood a deserted house. One day, there had been a great snowfall, and as young Kung accidentally passed by the door of the house, he noticed a well-dressed and prepossessing youth standing there who bowed to him and begged him to approach. Now, young Kung was a scholar and could appreciate good manners. 
finding that the youth and himself had much in common. He took a liking to him and followed him into the house. It was immaculately clean. Silk curtains hung before the doors, and on the walls were pictures of good old masters. On a table lay a book entitled Tales of the Coral Ring. Coral Ring was the name of a cavern. Once upon a time, there lived a monk at Puto, who was exceedingly learned. An aged man had led him into the cave in question, where he had seen a number of volumes on the bookstands. The aged man had said, These are the histories of the various dynasties. In a second room were to be found the histories of all the peoples on earth. A third was guarded by two dogs. The aged man explained, in this room are kept the secret reports of the immortals, telling the arts by means of which they gained eternal life. The two dogs are two dragons. The monk turned the pages of the books and found that they were all works of ancient times, such as he had never seen before. He would gladly have remained in the cave, but the old man said that would not do and a boy led him out again. The name of that cave, however, was the Coral Ring, and it was described in the volume which lay on the table. The youth questioned Kung regarding his name and family, and the latter told him his whole history. The youth pitied him greatly and advised him to open a school. Kung answered with a sigh, I am quite unknown in the neighborhood, and have no one to recommend me, said the youth. If you do not consider me altogether too unworthy and stupid, I should like to be your pupil myself. Young Kung was overjoyed. I should not dare to attempt to teach you, he replied. But together, we might dedicate ourselves to the study of science. He then asked why the house had been standing empty for so long. The youth answered, The owner of the house has gone to the country. We come from Shensi and have taken the house for a short time. We only moved in a few days ago. They chatted and joked together gaily, and the young man invited Kung to remain overnight, ordering a small boy to light a pan of charcoal. Then he stepped rapidly into the rear room and soon returned, saying, my father has come. As Kung rose, an aged man with a long white beard and eyebrows stepped into the room and said, greeting him, You have already declared your willingness to instruct my son, and I am grateful for your kindness. But you must be strict with him and not treat him as a friend. Then he had garments of silk, a fur cap, and shoes and socks of fur brought in and begged Kung to change his clothes. Wine and food were then served. The cushions and covers of the tables and chairs were made of stuffs unknown to Kung, and their shimmering radiance blinded the eye. The aged man retired after a few beakers of wine, and then the youth showed Kung his essays. They were all written in the style of the old masters, and not in the newfangled eight-section form. When he was asked about this, the youth said with a smile, I am quite indifferent to winning success at the state examinations. Then he turned to the small boy and said, See whether the old gentleman has already fallen asleep. If he has, you may quietly bring in little Hyang Nu. The boy went off and the youth took a lute from an embroidered case. At once, a serving maid entered, dressed in red, and surpassingly beautiful. The youth bade her sing The Lament of the Beloved, and her melting tones moved the heart. The third watch of the night had passed before they retired to sleep. On the following morning, all rose early, and study began. The youth was exceptionally gifted, Whatever he had seen but once was graven in his memory. Hence, he made surprising progress in the course of a few months. 
The old custom was followed of writing an essay every five days and celebrating its completion with a little banquet. And at each banquet, Hyung Nu was sent for. One evening, Kung could not remove his glance from Hyung Nu. The youth guessed his thoughts and said to him, You are as yet unmarried. Early and late, I keep thinking as to how I can provide you with a charming life companion. Hyung Nu is the serving maid of my father, so I cannot give her to you, said Kung. I am grateful to you for your friendly thought. But if the girl you have in mind is not just as beautiful as Hyung Nu, then I would rather do without. The youth laughed. You are indeed inexperienced if you think that Hyung Nu is beautiful. Your wish is easily fulfilled. Thus, half a year went by, and the monotonous rainy season had just began. Then, a swelling the size of a peach developed in Young Kung's breast, which increased overnight until it was as large as a teacup. He lay on his couch, groaning with pain, and unable to eat or to sleep. The youth was busy day and night nursing him, and even the old gentleman asked how he was getting along. Then the youth said, My little sister Jauna alone is able to cure this illness. Please send to grandmother and have her brought here. The old gentleman was willing, and he sent off his boy. The next day, the boy came back with the news that Jana would come, together with her aunt and her cousin, Isung. Not long after the youth led his sister into the room, she was not more than thirteen or fourteen years of age, enchantingly beautiful and slender as a willow tree. When the sick man saw her, he forgot all his pain, and his spirits rose. The youth said to his sister, Jauna, This is my best friend, whom I love as a brother. I beg of you, little sister, to cure him of his illness. The maiden blushed with confusion, then she stepped up to the sickbed. While she was feeling his pulse, it seemed to him as though she brought the fragrance of orchards with her, said the maiden with a smile. No wonder that this illness has befallen him. His heart beats far too stormily. His illness is serious, but not incurable. Now the blood which has flowed has already gathered, so we will have to cut to cure. With that, she took her golden armlet from her arm and laid it on the aching place. She pressed it down very gently, and the swelling rose a full inch above the armlet so that it enclosed the entire swelling. Then she loosed a penknife with a blade as thin as paper from her silken girdle. With one hand, she held the armlet, and with the other, she took the knife and lightly passed it around the bottom of the ring. Black blood gushed forth and ran over mattress and bed. But young Kung was so enchanted by the presence of the beautiful Gianna that not only did he feel no pain, but his one fear was that the whole affair might end too soon and that she would disappear from his sight. In a moment, the diseased flesh had been cut away and Jiana had fresh water brought and cleansed the wound. Then she took a small red pellet from her mouth and laid it on the wound, and when she turned around in a circle, it seemed to Kung as though she drew out all the inflammation and steam and flames. Once more she turned in a circle, and he felt his wound itch and quiver, and when she turned for the third time, he was completely cured. The maiden took the pellet into her mouth again and said, Now all is well. Then she hastened into the inner room. Young Kung leaped up in order to thank her. True, he was now cured of his illness, but his thoughts continued to dwell on Jauna's pretty face. He neglected his books and sat lost in daydreams. His friend had noticed it and said to him, I have at last succeeded this very day 
in finding an attractive life companion for you. Kung asked who she might be. The daughter of my aunt, Asung. She is 17 years of age, and anything but homely. I am sure she is not as beautiful as Jana, thought Kung. Then he hummed the lines of a song to himself. Who once has seen the sea close by? All rivers, shallow streams declares. Who o'er Wu's hill the clouds watched fly? Says nothing with that view compares. The youth smiled. My little sister, Jiaona, is still very young, said he. Besides, she is my father's only daughter, and he would not like to see her marry someone from afar. But my cousin, A. Sung, is not homely either. If you do not believe me, wait until they go walking in the garden, and then you may take a look at them without their knowing it. Kung posted himself at the open window on the lookout, and sure enough, he saw Jiaona come along leading another girl by the hand, a girl so beautiful that there was none other like her. Jiana and she seemed to be sisters, only to be told apart by a slight difference in age. Then young Kung was exceedingly happy and begged his friend to act for him in arranging the marriage, which the latter promised to do. The next day he came to Kung and told him amid congratulations that everything was arranged. A special court was put in order for the young pair, and the wedding was celebrated. Young Kung felt as though he had married a fairy, and the two became very fond of each other. One day, Kung's friend came to him in a state of great excitement and said, The owner of this house is coming back and my father now wishes to return to Shensi. The time for us to part draws near, and I am very sad. Kung wished to accompany them, but his friend advised him to return to his own home. Kung mentioned the difficulties in the way, but the youth replied, That need not worry you, because I will accompany you. After a time the father came, together with Aesong, and made Kung a present of a hundred ounces of gold. Then the youth took Kung and his wife by the hand and told them to close their eyes. As soon as they did so, off they went through the air like a storm wind. All Kung could notice was that the gale roared about his ears. When some time had passed, the youth said, Now we have arrived. Kung opened his eyes and saw his old home and then he knew that his friend was not of humankind. Gaily, they knocked at the door of his home. His mother opened it, and when she saw that he had brought along so charming a wife, she was greatly pleased. Then Kung turned around to his friend, but the latter had already disappeared. Aesung served her mother-in-law with great devotion, and her beauty and virtue was celebrated far and near. Soon after young Kung gained the doctorate and was appointed inspector of prisons in Shenzi. He took his wife along with him, but his mother remained at home, since Shenzi was too far for her to travel. And heaven gave Aesung and Kung a little son. But Kung became involved in a dispute with a traveling censor. The latter complained about Kung, and he was dismissed from his post. So it happened that one day he was idling about before the city when he saw a handsome youth riding a black mule. When he looked more closely, he saw that it was his old friend. They fell into each other's arms, laughing and weeping, and the youth led him to a village. In the midst of a thick grove of trees, which threw a deep shade, stood a house whose upper stories rose to the skies. One could see at a glance that people of distinction lived there. Kung now inquired after Sister Jiaona and was told that she had married. He remained overnight and then went off to fetch his wife. In the meantime, Jiaona arrived. 
she took Aesung's little son in her arms and said, Cousin, this is a little stranger in our family. Kung greeted her, and again thanked her for the kindness she had shown him in curing his illness. She answered with a smile, Since then, you have become a distinguished man, and the wound has long since healed. Have you still not forgotten your pain? Then, Jiana's husband arrived, and everyone became acquainted. And after that, they parted. One day, the youth came sadly to Kung and said, We are threatened by a great misfortune today. I do not know whether you would be willing to save us. Kung did not know what it might be, but he gladly promised his aid. Then the youth called up the entire family, and they bowed down in the outer court. He began, I will tell you the truth just as it is. We are foxes. This day we are threatened by the danger of thunder. If you care to save us, then there is a hope that we may manage to stay alive. If not, then take your child and go, so that you are not involved in our danger. But Kung vowed that he would share life and death with them. Then the youth begged him to stand in the door with a sword in his hand and said, Now, when the thunder begins to roll, you must stand there and never stir. Suddenly, dark clouds rose in the sky, and the heavens grew gloomy, as if night were closing down. Kung looked about him, but the buildings had all disappeared, and behind him he could only see a high barrow, in which was a large cave whose interior was lost in darkness. In the midst of his fright, he was surprised by a thunderbolt. A heavy rain poured down in streams, and a storm wind arose, which rooted up the tallest trees. Everything glimmered before his eyes, and his ears were deafened. But he held his sword in his hand, and stood as firm as a rock. Suddenly, in the midst of black smoke and flashes of lightning, he saw a monster with a pointed beak and long claws, which was carrying off a human body. When he looked more closely, he recognized by the dress that it was Jiana. He leaped up at the monster and struck at him with his sword, and at once Jana fell to the ground. A tremendous crash of thunder shook the earth, and Kung fell down dead. Then the tempest cleared away, and the blue sky appeared once more. Jana had regained consciousness, and when she saw Kung lying dead beside her, she said amid sobs, he died for my sake. Why should I continue to live? Ah Sung also came out, and together they carried him into the cave. Jana told A Sung to hold his head while her brother opened his mouth. She herself took hold of his chin and brought out her little red pellet. She pressed it against his lips with her own and breathed into his lungs. Then the breath came back to his throat with a rattling noise, and in a short time, he was himself once more. So there was the whole family reunited again, and none of its members had come to harm. They gradually recovered from their fright and were quite happy, when suddenly a small boy brought the news that Jana's husband and his whole family had been killed by the thunder. Gianna broke down, weeping, and the others tried to comfort her. Finally, Kung said, It is not well to dwell too long amid the graves of the dead. Will you not come home with me? Thereupon, they packed up their belongings and went with him. He assigned a deserted garden, which he carefully walled off to his friend and his family as a dwelling place. Only when Kung and Asung came to visit them was the bolt drawn. Then Jiana and her brother played chess, drank tea, and chatted with them like members of the same family. But Kung's little son had a somewhat pointed face, which resembled a fox's, and when he went along the street, 
the people would turn around and say, There goes the fox child. Note, not in the newfangled eight-section form. Bagu Wenchang, that is, essays in eight-section form, divided according to strict rules, were the customary theses in the governmental examinations in China up to the time of the great educational reform. Today, there is a general return to the style of the old masters, the free form of composition. The danger of thunder. Three times the foxes must have escaped the mortal danger of thunder. The end. The heartless husband. In olden times, Han Chao was the capital of southern China, and for that reason, a great number of beggars had gathered there. These beggars were in the habit of electing a leader who was officially entrusted with the supervision of all begging in the town. It was his duty to see that the beggars did not molest the townsfolk, and he received a tenth of their income from all his beggar subjects. When it snowed or rained, and the beggars could not go out to beg, he had to see to it that they had something to eat, and he also had to conduct their weddings and funerals. And the beggars obeyed him in all things. Well, it happened that there was a beggar king of this sort in Han Chao by the name of Gin, in whose family the office had been handed down from father to son for seven generations. What they had taken in by way of beggar's pence they had lent out on interest. And so the family had gradually become well-to-do, and finally even rich. The old beggar king had lost his wife at the age of fifty, but he had an only child, a girl who was called Little Golden Daughter. She had a face of rare beauty and was the jewel of his love. She had been versed in the lore of books from her youth up and could write, improvise poems, and compose essays. She was also experienced in needlework, a skilled dancer and singer, and could play the flute and zither. The old beggar king, above all else, wanted her to have a scholar for a husband. Yet, because he was a beggar king, the distinguished families avoided him, and with those who were of less standing than himself, he did not wish to have anything to do. So, it came about that little golden daughter had reached the age of eighteen without being betrothed. Now, at that time, there dwelt in Han Chao, near the Bridge of Peace, a scholar by the name of Mosu. He was twenty years of age and universally popular because of his beauty and talent. His parents were both dead, and he was so poor that he could hardly manage to keep alive. His house and lot had long since been mortgaged or sold, and he lived in an abandoned temple, and many a day passed at whose end he went hungry to bed. A neighbor took pity on him and said to him one day, The beggar king has a child named Little Golden Daughter, who is beautiful beyond all telling and the beggar king is rich and has money, but no son to inherit it. If you wish to marry into his family, his whole fortune would in the end come to you. Is that not better than dying of hunger as a poor scholar? At that time, Mosu was in dire extremity. Hence, when he heard these words, he was greatly pleased. He begged the neighbor to act as a go-between in the matter, so the latter visited the old beggar king and talked with him, and the beggar king talked over the matter with little golden daughter. And since Mosu came from a good family, and was, in addition, talented and learned, and had no objection to marrying into their family, they were both much pleased with the prospect. So they agreed to the proposal, and the two were married. So Mosu became a member of the beggar king's family. He was happy in his wife's beauty, always had enough to eat and good clothes to wear. 
so he thought himself lucky beyond his deserts, and lived with his wife in peace and happiness. The beggar king and his daughter, to whom their low estate was a thorn in the flesh, admonished Mosu to be sure to study hard. They hoped that he would make a name for himself, and thus reflect glory on their family as well. They bought books for him, old and new, at the highest prices, and they always supplied him liberally with money so that he could move in aristocratic circles. They also paid his examination expenses, so his learning increased day by day, and the fame of it spread through the entire district. He passed one examination after another in rapid succession, and at the age of 23 was appointed Mandarin of the district of Wu Wei. He returned from his audience with the emperor in ceremonial robes, high on horseback. Mosu had been born in Han Chao, so the whole town soon knew that he had passed his examination successfully, and the townsfolk crowded together on both sides of the street to look at him as he rode to his father-in-law's house. Old and young, women and children gathered to enjoy the show, and some idle loafer called out in a loud voice, The old beggar's son-in-law has become a mandarin. Mosu blushed with shame when he heard these words. Speechless and out of sorts, he seated himself in his room. But the old beggar king, in the joy of his heart, did not notice his ill humor. He had a great festival banquet prepared, to which he invited all his neighbors and good friends. But most of the invited guests were beggars and poor folk, and he insisted that Mosu eat with them. With much difficulty, Mosu was induced to leave his room. Yet, when he saw the guests gathered around the table, as ragged and dirty as a horde of hungry devils, he retired again with disdain. Little golden daughter, who realized how he felt, tried to cheer him up again in a hundred and one ways, but all in vain. A few days later, Mosu, with his wife and servants, set out for the new district he was to govern. One goes from Hancho to Wuwi by water. So they entered a ship and sailed out to the Yangtze Kiang. At the end of the first day, they reached a city where they anchored. The night was clear, and the moon rays glittered on the water, and Mosu sat in the front part of the ship, enjoying the moonlight. Suddenly, he chanced to think of the old beggar king. It was true that his wife was wise and good, but should heaven happen to bless them with the children, these children would always be the beggar's nephews and nieces, and there was no way of preventing such a disgrace. And thus, thinking a plan occurred to him. He called little golden daughter out of the cabin to come and enjoy the moonlight, and she came out to him happily. Men's servants and maid servants and all the sailors had long since gone to sleep. He looked about him on all sides, but there was no one to be seen. Little Golden Daughter was standing at the front of the ship, thinking no evil, when a hand suddenly thrust her into the water. Then Mosu pretended to be frightened and began to call out. My wife made a misstep and has fallen into the water and when they heard his words, the servants hurried up and wanted to fish her out. But Mosu said, She has already been carried away by the current, so you need not trouble yourselves. Then he gave orders to set sail again as soon as possible. Now, who would have thought that owing to a fortunate chance, Sir Hu, the Mandarin in charge of the transportation system of the province, was also about to take charge of his department, and had anchored in the same place. He was sitting with his wife at the open window of the ship's cabin, enjoying the moonlight and the cool breeze. Suddenly, he heard someone crying on the shore, 
and it sounded to him like a girl's voice. He quickly sent people to assist her, and they brought her aboard. It was little Golden Daughter. When she had fallen into the water, she had felt something beneath her feet, which held her up so that she did not sink. And she had been carried along by the current to the river bank, where she crept out of the water. And then she realized that her husband, now that he had become distinguished, had forgotten how poor he had been. And for all she had not been drowned, she felt very lonely and abandoned. And before she knew it, her tears began to flow. So when Sir Hu asked her what was the matter, she told him the whole story. Sir Hu comforted her. You must not shed another tear, said he. If you care to become my adopted daughter, we will take care of you. Little Golden Daughter bowed her thanks. But whose wife ordered her maids to bring other clothes to take the place of the wet ones and to prepare a bed for her? The servants were strictly bidden to call her Miss and to say nothing of what had occurred. So the journey continued, and in a few days' time, Sir Hu entered upon his official duties. Wu Wei, where Mo Su was district Mandarin, was subject to his rule, and the latter made his appearance in order to visit his official superior. When Sir Hu saw Mo Su, he thought to himself, What a pity that so highly gifted a man should act in so heartless a manner. When a few months had passed, Sir Hu said to his subordinates, I have a daughter who is very pretty and good, and would like to find a son-in-law to marry into my family. Do you know of anyone who might answer? His subordinates all knew that Mosu was young and had lost his wife, so they unanimously suggested him. Sir Hu replied, I have also thought of that gentleman, but he is young and has risen very rapidly. I am afraid he has loftier ambitions and would not care to marry into my family and become my son-in-law. He was originally poor, answered his people, and he is your subordinate. Should you care to show him a kindness of this sort, he will be sure to accept it joyfully and will not object to marrying into your family. Well, if you all believe it can be done, said Sir Hu, then pay him a visit and find out what he thinks about it. But you must not say that I have sent you. Mosu, who was just then reflecting how he might win Sir Hu's favor, took up the suggestion with pleasure and urgently begged them to act as his go-between in the matter, promising them a rich reward when the connection was established. So they went back again and reported to Sir Hu. He said, I am much pleased that the gentleman in question does not disdain this marriage, but my wife and I are extremely fond of this daughter of ours, and we can hardly resign ourselves to giving her up. Sir Mosu is young and aristocratic, and our little daughter has been spoiled. If he were to ill-treat her, or at some future time were to regret having married into our family, my wife and I would be inconsolable. For this reason, everything must be clearly understood in advance. Only if he positively agrees to do these things would I be able to receive him into my family. Mosu was informed of all these conditions and declared himself ready to accept them. Then he brought gold and pearls and colored silks to Sir Hu's daughter as wedding gifts, and a lucky day was chosen for the wedding. Sir Hu charged his wife to talk to little golden daughter. Your adopted father, said she, feels sorry for you because you are lonely and therefore has picked out a young scholar for you to marry. But little golden daughter replied, It is true that I am of humble birth, yet I know what is fitting. 
it chances that I agreed to cast my lot with Mosu, for better or for worse. And though he has shown me but little kindness, I will marry no other man so long as he lives. I cannot bring myself to form another union and break my troth. And thus speaking, the tears poured from her eyes. When Sir Hu's wife saw that nothing would alter her resolve, she told her how matters really stood. Your adopted father, said she, is indignant at Mosu's heartlessness. And although he will see to it that you meet again, he has said nothing to Mosu which would lead him to believe that you are not our own daughter. Therefore, Mosu was delighted to marry you. But when the wedding is celebrated this evening, you must do thus and so, in order that he may taste your just anger. When she had heard all this, little golden daughter dried her tears and thanked her adopted parents. Then she adorned herself for the wedding. The same day, late at evening, Mosu came to the house wearing golden flowers on his hat and a red scarf across his breast, riding on a gaily trapped horse and followed by a great retinue. All his friends and acquaintances came with him in order to be present at the festival celebration. In Sir Hu's house, everything had been adorned with colored cloths and lanterns. Mosu dismounted from his horse at the entrance of the hall. Here, Sir Hu had spread a festival banquet to which Mosu and his friends were led. And when the goblet had made the rounds three times, serving maids came and invited Mosu to follow them to the inner rooms. The bride, veiled in a red veil, was led in by two maid servants. Following the injunctions of the master of the ceremony, they worshipped heaven and earth together, and then the parents-in-law. Thereupon they went into another apartment. Here brightly colored candles were burning, and a wedding dinner had been prepared. Mosu felt as happy as though he had been raised to the seventh heaven. But when he wanted to leave the room, seven or eight maids with bamboo canes in their hands appeared at each side of the door and began to beat him without mercy. They knocked his bridal hat from his head, and then the blows rained down upon his back and shoulders. When Mosu cried for help, he heard a delicate voice say, You need not kill that heartless bridegroom of mine completely. Ask him to come in and greet me. Then the maids stopped beating him and gathered about the bride, who removed her bridal veil. Mosu bowed with lowered head and said, but what have I done? Yet when he raised his eyes, he saw that none other than his wife, little golden daughter, was standing before him. He started with fright and cried, A ghost! A ghost! But all the servants broke out into loud laughter. At last, Sir Hu and his wife came in, and the former said, My dear son-in-law, you may rest assured that my adopted daughter who came to me while I was on my way to this place, is no ghost. Then Mosu hastily fell on his knees and answered, I have sinned and beg for mercy. And he kowtowed without end. With that, I have nothing to do, remarked Sir Hu. If our little daughter only gets along well with you, then all will be in order. But little golden daughter said, You heartless scoundrel, in the beginning, you were poor and needy. We took you into our family and let you study so that you might become somebody and make a name for yourself. But no sooner had you become a Mandarin and a man of standing than your love turned into enmity and you forgot your duty as a husband and pushed me into the river. Fortunately, I found my dear adopted parents thereby they fished me out and made me their own child. Otherwise, I would have found a grave in the bellies of the fishes. 
how can I honorably live again with such a man as you? With these words, she began to lament loudly, and she called him one hard-hearted scoundrel after another. Mosu lay before her, speechless with shame, and begged her to forgive him. Now, when Sir Hu noticed that little golden daughter had sufficiently relieved herself by her scolding, he helped Mosu up and said to him, My dear son-in-law, if you repent of your misdeed, little golden daughter will gradually cease to be angry. Of course you are an old married couple. Yet, as you have renewed your vows this evening in my house, kindly do me a favor and listen to what I have to say. You, Mosu, are weighed with a heavy burden of guilt. And for that reason, you must not resent your wife's being somewhat indignant, but must have patience with her. I will call in my wife to make peace between you. With these words, Sir Hu went out and sent in his wife, who finally, after a great deal of difficulty, succeeded in reconciling the two, so that they agreed once more to take up life as husband and wife. And they esteemed and loved each other twice as much as they had before. Their life was all happiness and joy. And later, when Sir Hu and his wife died, they mourned for them, as if in truth they had been their own parents. Note, to marry into. As a rule, the wife enters the home of her husband's parents. But when there is no male heir, it is arranged that the son-in-law continues the family of his wife's parents and lives in their home. The custom is still very prevalent in Japan, but it is not considered very honorable in China to enter into a strange family in this way. It is characteristic that Mosu, as a punishment for disdaining to marry into a family the first time, is obliged to marry into a second time the family of Sir Hu. The costume here described is still the wedding costume of China. Little golden daughter said, you heartless scoundrel. Despite her faithfulness, in accordance with Chinese custom, she is obliged to show her anger over his faithlessness. This is necessary before the matter can be properly adjusted so that she may preserve her face. The end. A Rose of Evening On the fifth day of the fifth month, the festival of the dragon junk is held along the Yangtze Kiang. A dragon is hollowed out of wood, painted with an armor of scales, and adorned with gold and bright colors. A carved red railing surrounds the ship, and its sails and flags are made of silks and brocade. The after part of the vessel is called the dragon's tail. It rises ten feet above the water, and a board which floats in the water is tied to it by means of a cloth. Upon this board sit boys who turn somersaults, stand on their heads, and perform all sorts of tricks. Yet, being so close to the water, their danger is very great. It is the custom, therefore, when a boy is hired for this purpose, to give his parents money before he is trained. Then, if he falls into the water and is drowned, no one has him on their conscience. Farther south, the custom differs in so much that instead of boys, beautiful girls are chosen for this purpose. In Duchen Giang, there once lived a widow named Xiang, who had a son called Adwan. When he was no more than seven years of age, he was extraordinarily skillful, and no other boy could equal him. And his reputation increasing as he grew, he earned more and more money. So it happened that he was still called upon at the Dragon Junk Festival when he was already sixteen. But one day, he fell into the water below the Gold Island and was drowned. He was the only son of his mother and she sorrowed over him, and that was the end of it. Yet, Adwan did not know that he had been drowned. He met two men who took him along with them, 
and he saw a new world in the midst of the waters of the Yellow River. When he looked around, the waves of the river towered steeply about him like walls, and a palace was visible, in which sat a man wearing armor and a helmet. His two companions said to him, That is the prince of the dragon's cave, and bade him kneel. The prince of the dragon's cave seemed to be of a mild and kindly disposition, and said, We can make use of such a skillful lad. He may take part in the dance of the willow branches. So he was brought to a spot surrounded by extensive buildings. He entered, and was greeted by a crowd of boys who were all about fourteen years of age. An old woman came in, and they all called out, This is Mother Hia. And she sat down, and had Adwan show his tricks. Then she taught him the dance of the flying thunders of Tiantang River, and the music that calms the winds on the sea of Dongting. When the cymbals and kettle drums re-echoed through all the courts, they deafened the ear. Then again, all the courts would fall silent. Mother Hia thought that Adwan would not be able to grasp everything the very first time, so she taught him with great patience. But Adwan had understood everything from the first, and that pleased old Mother Hia. This boy, said she, equals our own rose of evening. The following day, the prince of the dragon's cave held a review of his dancers. When all the dancers had assembled, the dance of the ogres was danced first. Those who performed it all wore devil masks and garments of scales. They beat upon enormous cymbals, and their kettle drums were so large that four men could just about span them. Their sound was like the sound of a mighty thunder, and the noise was so great that nothing else could be heard. When the dance began, tremendous waves spouted up to the very skies, and then fell down again like star glimmer which scatters in the air. The prince of the dragon cave hastily bade the dance cease, and had the dancers of the nightingale round step forth. These were all lovely young girls of sixteen. They made a delicate music with flutes, so that the breeze blew, and the roaring of the waves was stilled in a moment. The water gradually became as quiet as a crystal world, transparent to its lowest depths. When the nightingale dancers had finished, they withdrew and posted themselves in the western courtyard. Then came the turn of the swallow dancers. These were all little girls. One among them, who was about fifteen years of age, danced the dance of the giving of flowers with flying sleeves and waving locks. And as their garments fluttered, many colored flowers dropped from their folds and were caught up by the wind and whirled about the whole courtyard. When the dance had ended, this dancer also went off with the rest of the girls to the western courtyard. Adwan looked at her from out the corner of his eye and fell deeply in love with her. He asked his comrades who she might be, and they told him she was named Rose of Evening. But the willow spray dancers were now called out. The prince of the dragon cave was especially desirous of testing Adwan. So Adwan danced alone, and he danced with joy or defiance, according to the music. When he looked up, and when he looked down, his glances held the beat of the measure. The dragon prince, enchanted with his skill, presented him with a garment of five colors, and gave him a carbuncle set in golden threads of fishbeard for a hair jewel. Adwan bowed his thanks for the gift, and then also hastened to the western courtyard. There all the dancers stood in rank and file. Adwan could only look at Rose of Evening from a distance, but still Rose of Evening returned his glances. After a time, 
Adwan gradually slipped to the end of his file, and rows of evening also drew near to him, so that they stood only a few feet away from each other. But the strict rules allowed no confusion in the ranks, so they could only gaze and let their souls go out to each other. Now the butterfly dance followed the others. This was danced by the boys and girls together, and the pairs were equal in size, age, and the color of their garments. When all the dances had ended, the dancers marched out with the goose step. The willow spray dancers followed the swallow dancers, and Adwan hastened in advance of his company, while Rose of Evening lingered along after hers. She turned her head, and when she spied Adwan, she purposely let a coral pin fall from her hair. Adwan hastily hid it in his sleeve. When he had returned, he was sick with longing and could neither eat nor sleep. Mother Hia brought him all sorts of dainties, looked after him three or four times a day, and stroked his forehead with loving care. But his illness did not yield in the least. Mother Hia was unhappy and yet helpless. The birthday of the king of the Wu River is at hand, said she. What is to be done? In the twilight there came a boy who sat down on the edge of Adwan's bed and chatted with him. He belonged to the butterfly dancers, said he, and asked casually, Are you sick because of Rose of Evening? Adwan, frightened, asked him how he came to guess it. The other boy said with a smile, Well, because Rose of Evening is in the same case as yourself. Disconcerted, Adwan sat up and begged the boy to advise him. Are you able to walk? asked the latter. If I exert myself, said Adwan, I think I could manage it. So the boy led him to the south. There he opened a gate, and they turned the corner to the west. Once more the doors of the gate flew open, and now Adwan saw a lotus field about twenty acres in size. The lotus flowers were all growing on level earth and their leaves were as large as mats, and their flowers like umbrellas. The fallen blossoms covered the ground beneath the stalks to the depth of a foot or more. The boy led a duan in and said, Now first of all sit down for a little while. Then he went away. After a time, a beautiful girl thrust aside the lotus flowers and came into the open. It was rose of evening, they looked at each other with happy timidity, and each told how each had longed for the other, and they also told each other of their former life. Then they weighted the lotus leaves with stones, so that they made a cozy retreat, in which they could be together, and promised to meet each other there every evening. And then they parted. Adwan came back, and his illness left him. From that time on, he met rows of evening every day in the lotus field. After a few days had passed, they had to accompany the prince of the dragon cave to the birthday festival of the king of the Wu River. The festival came to an end, and all the dancers returned home. Only the king had kept back rows of evening and one of the nightingale dancers to teach the girls in his castle. Months passed, and no news came from Rose of Evening, so that Adwan went about full of longing and despair. Now Mother Hia went every day to the castle of the god of the Wu River. So Adwan told her that Rose of Evening was his cousin, and entreated her to take him along with her, so that he could at least see her a single time. So she took him along, and let him stay at the lodge house of the river god, for a few days. But the indwellers of the castle were so strictly watched that he could not see Rose of Evening even a single time. Sadly, Adwan went back again. Another month passed, and Adwan, filled with gloomy thoughts, wished that death might be his portion. 
One day, Mother Hia came to him full of pity and began to sympathize with him. What a shame, said she, that Rose of Evening has cast herself into the river. Adwan was extremely frightened, and his tears flowed resistlessly. He tore his beautiful garments, took his gold and his pearls, and went out with the sole idea of following his beloved in death. Yet the waters of the river stood up before him like walls, and no matter how often he ran against them, head down, they always flung him back. He did not dare return, since he feared he might be questioned about his festival garments, and severely punished because he had ruined them. So he stood there and knew not what to do, while the perspiration ran down to his ankles. Suddenly, at the foot of the water wall, he saw a tall tree. Like a monkey, he climbed up to its very top, and then, with all his might, he shot into the waves. And then, without being wet, he found himself suddenly swimming on the surface of the river. Unexpectedly, the world of men rose up once more before his dazzled eyes. He swam to the shore, and as he walked along the river bank, his thoughts went back to his old mother. He took a ship and traveled home. When he reached the village, it seemed to him as though all the houses in it belonged to another world. The following morning, he entered his mother's house, and as he did so, heard a girl's voice beneath the window saying, Your son has come back again. The voice sounded like the voice of Rose of Evening, and when she came to greet him at his mother's side, sure enough, it was Rose of Evening herself. And in that hour, the joy of these two who were so fond of each other overcame all their sorrow. But in the mother's mind, sorrow and doubt, terror and joy mingled in constant succession in a thousand different ways. When Rose of Evening had been in the palace of the River King and had come to realize that she would never see Aduan again, she determined to die and flung herself into the waters of the stream. But she was carried to the surface, and the waves carried and cradled her till a ship came by and took her aboard. They asked whence she came. Now Rose of Evening had originally been a celebrated singing girl of Wu, who had fallen into the river, and whose body had never been found. So she thought to herself that, after all, she could not return to her old life again. So she answered, Madame Xiang, in Dishengyang, is my mother-in-law. Then the travelers took passage for her in a ship which brought her to the place she had mentioned. The widow Jiang first said she must be mistaken, but the girl insisted that there was no mistake, and told Aduan's mother her whole story. Yet, though the latter was charmed by her surpassing loveliness, she feared that Rose of Evening was too young to live a widow's life. But the girl was respectful and industrious, and when she saw that poverty ruled in her new home, she took her pearls and sold them for a high price. Aduan's old mother was greatly pleased to see how seriously the girl took her duties. Now that Aduan had returned again, Rose of Evening could not control her joy, and even Aduan's old mother cherished the hope that after all, perhaps her son had not died. She secretly dug up her son's grave, yet all his bones were still lying in it. So she questioned Aduan, and then, for the first time, the latter realized that he was a departed spirit. Then, he feared that Rose of Evening might regard him with disgust because he was no longer a human being. So he ordered his mother on no account to speak of it, and this his mother promised. Then she spread the report in the village that the body which had been found in the river 
had not been that of her son at all. Yet she could not rid herself of the fear that, since Aduan was a departed spirit, heaven might refuse to send him a child. In spite of her fear, however, she was able to hold a grandson in her arms in course of time. When she looked at him, he was no different from other children. And then her cup of joy was filled to overflowing. Rose of Evening gradually became aware of the fact that Adwan was not really a human being. Why did you not tell me at once, said she, departed spirits who wear the garments of the dragon castle, surround themselves with a soul casing so heavy in texture that they can no longer be distinguished from the living. And if one can obtain the lime made of dragon horn, which is in the castle, then the bones may be glued together in such wise that flesh and blood will grow over them again. What a pity that we could not obtain the lime while we were there. Adwan sold his pearl, for which a merchant from foreign parts gave him an enormous sum. Thus his family grew very wealthy. Once, on his mother's birthday, he danced with his wife and sang in order to please her. The news reached the castle of the dragon prince, and he thought to carry off Rose of Evening by force. But Adwan, alarmed, went to the prince, and declared that both he and his wife were departed spirits. They examined him, and since he cast no shadow, his word was taken, and he was not robbed of Rose of Evening. Note. Rose of Evening is one of the most idyllic of Chinese art fairy tales. The idea that the departed spirit throws no shadow has analogies in Norse and other European fairy tales. The End The Ape Sun Wukong Far, far away to the east, in the midst of the Great Sea, there is an island called the Mountain of Flowers and Fruits, and on this mountain there is a high rock. Now this rock from the very beginning of the world, had absorbed all the hidden seed power of heaven and earth and sun and moon, which endowed it with supernatural creative gifts. One day the rock burst, and out came an egg of stone. And out of this stone egg, a stone ape was hatched by magic power. When he broke the shell, he bowed to all sides. Then he gradually learned to walk, and to leap, and two streams of golden radiance broke from his eyes, which shot up to the highest of the castles of heaven, so that the Lord of the heavens was frightened. So he sent out the two gods, Thousand Mile Eye and Fine Ear, to find out what had happened. The two gods came back and reported, The rays shine from the eyes of the stone ape who was hatched out of the egg which came from the magic rock. There is no reason for uneasiness. Little by little, the ape grew up, ran and leaped about, drank from the springs in the valleys, ate the flowers and fruits, and time went by in unconstrained play. One day, during the summer, when he was seeking coolness, together with the other apes on the island, they went to the valley to bathe. There, they saw a waterfall which plunged down a high cliff. Said the apes to each other, Whoever can force his way through the waterfall without suffering injury shall be our king. The stone ape at once leaped into the air with joy and cried, I will pass through. Then he closed his eyes, bent down low, and leaped through the roar and foam of the waters. When he opened his eyes once more, he saw an iron bridge, which was shut off from the outer world by the waterfall, as though by a curtain. At its entrance stood a tablet of stone, on which were graven the words. This is the heavenly cave behind the water curtain on the blessed island of flowers and fruits. Filled with joy, the stone ape leaped out again through the waterfall, 
they received the news with great content, and begged the stone ape to take them there. So the tribe of apes leaped through the water on the iron bridge, and then crowded into the cave castle, where they found a hearth with a profusion of pots, cups, and platters. But all were made of stone. Then the apes paid homage to the stone ape as their king, and he was given the name of Handsome King of the Apes. He appointed long-tailed, ring-tailed, and other monkeys to be his officials and counselors, servants and retainers. And they led a blissful life on the mountain, sleeping by night in their cave castle, keeping away from birds and beasts, and their king enjoyed untroubled happiness. In this way, some three hundred years went by. One day, when the king of the apes sat with his subjects at a merry meal, he suddenly began to weep. Frightened, the apes asked him why he so suddenly grew sad amid all his bliss. Said the king, It is true that we are not subject to the law and rule of man, that birds and beasts do not dare attack us. Yet little by little we grow old and weak, and some day the hour will strike when death, the ancient, will drag us off. Then we are gone in a moment, and can no longer dwell upon earth. When the apes heard these words, they hid their faces and sobbed. But an old ape, whose arms were connected in such a way that he could add the length of one to that of the other, stepped forth from the ranks. In a loud tone of voice, he said, That you have hit upon this thought, O king shows the desire to search for truth has awakened you. Among all living creatures, there are but three kinds who are exempt from death's power, the Buddhas, the blessed spirits, and the gods. Whoever attains one of these three grades escapes the rod of rebirth and lives as long as the heavens themselves. The king of the apes said, where do these three kinds of beings live? And the old ape replied, They live in caves and on holy mountains in the great world of mortals. The king was pleased when he heard this and told his apes that he was going to seek out gods and sainted spirits in order to learn the road to immortality from them. The apes dragged up peaches and other fruits and sweet wine to celebrate the parting banquet and all made merry together. On the following morning, the handsome king of the apes rose very early, built him a raft of old pine trees, and took a bamboo staff for a pole. Then he climbed on the raft, quite alone, and poled his way through the great sea. Wind and waves were favorable, and he reached Asia. There he went ashore. On the strand, he met a fisherman, he at once stepped up to him, knocked him down, tore off his clothes, and put them on himself. Then he wandered around and visited all famous spots, went into the marketplaces, the densely populated cities, learned how to conduct himself properly, and how to speak and act like a well-bred human being. Yet his heart was set on learning the teaching of the Buddhas, the blessed spirits, and the holy gods. But the people of the country in which he was were only concerned with honors and wealth. Not one of them seemed to care for life. Thus, he went about until nine years had passed by unnoticed. Then he came to the strand of the Western Sea, and it occurred to him, no doubt, there are gods and saints on the other side of the sea. So he built another raft floated it over the western sea, and reached the land of the west. There he let his raft drift, and went ashore. After he had searched for many days, he suddenly saw a high mountain with deep, quiet valleys. As the ape king went toward it, he heard a man singing in the woods, and the song sounded like one the blessed spirits might sing. So he hastily entered the wood, 
to see who might be singing. There, he met a woodchopper at work. The ape king bowed to him and said, Venerable divine master, I fall down and worship at your feet, said the woodchopper. I am only a workman. Why do you call me divine master? Then, if you are no blessed god, how comes it you sing that divine song? The woodchopper laughed and said, You are at home in music. The song I was singing was really taught me by a saint. If you are acquainted with a saint, said the ape king, he surely cannot live far from here. I beg of you to show me the way to his dwelling. The woodchopper replied, It is not far from here. This mountain is known as the mountain of the heart. In it is a cave where dwells a saint who is called the discerner. The number of his disciples who have attained blessedness is countless. He still has some thirty to forty disciples gathered about him. You need only follow this path which leads to the south, and you cannot miss his dwelling. The ape king thanked the woodchopper, and sure enough, he came to the cave which the latter had described to him. The gate was locked, and he did not venture to knock. So he leaped up into a pine tree, picked pine cones, and devoured the seed. Before long, one of the saint's disciples came and opened the door and said, What sort of a beast is it that is making such a noise? The ape king leaped down from his tree, bowed, and said, I have come in search of truth. I did not venture to knock. Then the disciple had to laugh and said, Our master was seated lost in meditation when he told me to lead in the seeker after truth who stood without the gate. And here you really are. Well, you may come along with me. The ape king smoothed his clothes, put his hat on straight, and stepped in. A long passage led past magnificent buildings and quiet, hidden huts to the place where the master was sitting upright on a seat of white marble. At his right and left stood his disciples, ready to serve him. The ape king flung himself down on the ground and greeted the master humbly. In answer to his questions, he told him how he had found his way to him. And when he was asked his name, he said, I have no name. I am the ape who came out of the stone. So the master said, Then I will give you a name. I name you Sun Wu Kung. The ape king thanked him, full of joy, and thereafter he was called Sun Wu Kung. The master ordered his oldest disciple to instruct Sun Wu Kung in sweeping and cleaning in going in and out, in good manners, how to labor in the field, and how to water the gardens. In the course of time, he learned to write, to burn incense, and read the sutras. And in this way, some six or seven years went by. One day, the master ascended the seat from which he taught, and began to speak regarding the great truth. Sun Wu Kung understood the hidden meaning of his words and commenced to jerk about and dance in his joy. The master reproved him. Sun Wukong, you have still not laid aside your wild nature. What do you mean by carrying on in such an unfitting manner? Sun Wukong bowed and answered. I was listening attentively to you when the meaning of your words was disclosed to my heart. And without thinking, I began to dance for joy. I was not giving way to my wild nature, said the master. If your spirit has really awakened, then I will announce the great truth to you. But there are 360 ways by means of which one may reach this truth. Which way shall I teach you, said Sun Wukong. Whichever you will, O master. Then the master asked, Shall I teach you the way of magic? Said Sun Wukong, What does magic teach one? The master replied, It teaches one to raise up spirits 
to question oracles, and to foretell fortune and misfortune. Can one secure eternal life by means of it? inquired Sun Wukong. No, was the answer. Then I will not learn it. Shall I teach you the sciences? What are the sciences? They are the nine schools of the three faiths. You learn how to read the holy books, pronounce incantations, commune with the gods, and call the saints to you. Can one gain eternal life by means of them? No. Then I will not learn them. The way of repose is a very good way. What is the way of repose? It teaches how to live without nourishment, how to remain quiescent in silent purity, and sit lost in meditation. Can one gain eternal life in this way? No. Then I will not learn it. The way of deeds is also a good way. What does that teach? It teaches one to equalize the vital powers, to practice bodily exercise, to prepare the elixir of life, and to hold one's breath. Will it give one eternal life? Not so. Then I will not learn it. I will not learn it. Thereupon the master pretended to be angry, leaped down from his stand, took his cane, and scolded. What an ape! This he will not learn, and that he will not learn. What are you waiting to learn, then? With that, he gave him three blows across the head, retired to his inner chamber, and closed the great door after him. The disciples were greatly excited and overwhelmed Sun Wukong with reproaches. Yet the latter paid no attention to them, but smiled quietly to himself, for he had understood the riddle which the master had given him to solve. And in his heart, he thought, his striking me over the head three times meant that I was to be ready at the third watch of the night. His withdrawing to his inner chamber and closing the great door after him meant that I was to go in to him by the back door, and that he would make clear the great truth to me in secret. Accordingly, he waited until evening, and made a pretense of lying down to sleep with the other disciples. But when the third watch of the night had come, he rose softly and crept to the back door. Sure enough, it stood ajar. He slipped in and stepped before the master's bed. The master was sleeping with his face turned toward the wall, and the ape did not venture to wake him, but knelt down in front of the bed. After a time, the master turned around and hummed a stanza to himself, a hard, hard grind, truth's lesson to expound. One talks oneself deaf, dumb, and blind unless the right man's found. Then Sun Wukong replied, I am waiting here reverentially. The master flung on his clothes, sat up in bed and said harshly, A cursed ape, why are you not asleep? What are you doing here? Sun Wukong answered, Yet you pointed out to me yesterday that I was to come to you at the third watch of the night, by the back door, in order to be instructed in the truth. Therefore, I have ventured to come. If you will teach me in the fullness of your grace, I will be eternally grateful to you, thought the master to himself. There is real intelligence in this ape's head to have made him understand me so well. Then he replied, Sun Wu Kung, it shall be granted you. I will speak freely with you. Come quite close to me and then I will show you the way to eternal life. With that, he murmured into his ear a divine, magical incantation to further the concentration of his vital powers, and explained the hidden knowledge word for word. Sun Wukong listened to him eagerly, and in a short time had learned it by heart. Then he thanked his teacher, went out again, and lay down to sleep. From that time forward, he practiced the right mode of breathing, kept guard over his soul and spirit, and tamed the natural instincts of his heart, and
And while he did so, three more years passed by. Then the task was completed. One day, the master said to him, Three great dangers still threaten you. Everyone who wishes to accomplish something out of the ordinary is exposed to them, for he is pursued by the envy of demons and spirits. And only those who can overcome these three great dangers live as long as the heavens. Then Sun Wukong was frightened and asked, Is there any means of protection against these dangers? Then the master again murmured a secret incantation into his ear, by means of which he gained the power to transform himself seventy-two times. And when no more than a few days had passed, Sun Wukong had learned the art. One day, the master was walking before the cave in the company of his disciples. He called Sun Wukong up to him and asked, What progress have you made with your art? Can you fly already? Yes, indeed, said the ape. Then let me see you do so. The ape leaped into the air to a distance of five or six feet from the ground. Clouds formed beneath his feet, and he was able to walk on them for several hundred yards. Then he was forced to drop down to earth again. The master said with a smile, I call that crawling around on the clouds, not floating on them, as do the gods and saints who fly over the whole world in a single day. I will teach you the magic incantation for turning somersaults on the clouds. If you turn one of those somersaults, you advance 18,000 miles at a clip. Sun Wukong thanked him, full of joy, and from that time on, he was able to move without limitation of space in any direction. One day, Sun Wukong was sitting together with the other disciples under the pine tree by the gate, discussing the secrets of their teachings. Finally, they asked him to show them some of his transforming arts. Sun Wukong could not keep his secret to himself and agreed to do so. With a smile, he said, Just set me a task. What do you wish me to change myself into? They said, Turn yourself into a pine tree. So Sun Wukong murmured a magic incantation, turned around, and there stood a pine tree before their very eyes. At this, they all broke out into a horse laugh. The master heard the noise and came out of the gate, dragging his cane behind him. Why are you making such a noise? He called out to them harshly. Said they, Sun Wukong has turned himself into a pine tree, and this made us laugh. Sun Wukong, come here, said the master. Now just tell me what tricks you are up to. Why do you have to turn yourself into a pine tree? All the work you have done means nothing more to you than a chance to make magic for your companions to wonder at. That shows that your heart is not yet under control. Humbly, Sun Wukong begged his forgiveness. But the master said, I bear you no ill will, but you must go away. With tears in his eyes, Sun Wukong asked him, But where shall I go? You must go back again whence you came, said the master. And when Sun Wukong sadly bade him farewell, he threatened him. Your savage nature is sure to bring down evil upon you some time. You must tell no one that you are my pupil. If you so much as breathe a word about it, I will fetch your soul and lock it up in the nethermost hell, so that you cannot escape for a thousand eternities. Sun Wukong replied, I will not say a word. I will not say a word. Then he once more thanked him for all the kindness shown him, turned a somersault and climbed up to the clouds. Within the hour, he had passed the seas and saw the mountain of flowers and fruits lying before him. Then he felt happy and at home again, let his cloud sink down to earth and cried, Here I am back again, children. And at once, from the valley, from behind the rocks, out of the grass, and from amid the trees, 
came as apes. They came running up by thousands, surrounded and greeted him, and inquired as to his adventures. Sun Wukong said, I have now found the way to eternal life, and need fear, death the ancient no longer. Then all the apes were overjoyed, and competed with each other in bringing flowers and fruits, peaches and wine, to welcome him. And again, they honored Sun Wukong as the handsome ape king. Sun Wukong now gathered the apes about him, and questioned them as to how they had fared during his absence. Said they, It is well that you have come back again, great king. Not long ago, a devil came here who wanted to take possession of our cave by force. We fought with him, but he dragged away many of your children and will probably soon return. Sun Wukong grew very angry and said, What sort of a devil is this who dares be so impudent? The apes answered, He is the Devil King of Chaos. He lives in the north, who knows how many miles away. We only saw him come and go amid clouds and mist. Sun Wukong said, Wait, and I will see to him. With that, he turned a somersault and disappeared without a trace. In the furthest north rises a high mountain, upon whose slope is a cave, above which is the inscription, The Cave of the Kidneys. Before the door, little devils were dancing. Sun Wukong called harshly to them, Tell your devil king quickly that he had better give me my children back again. The little devils were frightened and delivered the message in the cave. Then the devil king reached for his sword and came out. But he was so large and broad that he could not even see Sun Wukong. He was clad from head to foot in black armor, and his face was as black as the bottom of a kettle. Sun Wukong shouted at him, Accursed devil, where are your eyes, that you cannot see the venerable sun? Then the devil looked to the ground and saw a stone ape standing before him, bareheaded, dressed in red, with a yellow girdle and black boots. So the Devil King laughed and said, You are not even four feet high, less than thirty years of age, and weaponless, and yet you venture to make such a commotion. Said Sun Wukong, I am not too small for you, and I can make myself large at will. You scorn me because I am without a weapon, but my two fists can thresh to the very skies. With that, he stooped, clenched his fists, and began to give the devil a beating. The devil was large and clumsy, but Sun Wukong leaped about nimbly. He struck him between the ribs, and between the wind and his blows, fell ever more fast and furious. In his despair, the devil raised his great knife and aimed a blow at Sun Wukong's head. But the latter avoided the blow and fell back on his magic powers of transformation. He pulled out a hair, put it in his mouth, chewed it, spat it out into the air, and said, Transform yourself. And at once, it turned into many hundreds of little apes who began to attack the devil. Sun Wukong, be it said, had 84,000 hairs on his body, every single one of which he could transform. The little apes with their sharp eyes leaped around with the greatest rapidity. They surrounded the Devil King on all sides, tore at his clothes, and pulled at his legs, until he finally measured his length on the ground. Then Sun Wukong stepped up, tore his knife from his hand, and put an end to him. After that, he entered the cave and released his captive children, the apes the transformed hairs he drew to him again, and making a fire, he burned the evil cave to the ground. Then he gathered up those he had released, and flew back with them like a storm wind to his cavern on the mountain of flowers and fruits, joyfully greeted by all the apes. After Sun Wukong had obtained possession of the Devil King's great knife, 
he exercised his apes every day. They had wooden swords and lances of bamboo and played their martial music on reed pipes. He had them build a camp so that they would be prepared for all dangers. Suddenly, the thought came to Sun Wukong. If we go on this way, perhaps we may incite some human or animal king to fight with us, and then we would not be able to withstand him with our wooden swords and bamboo lances. And to his apes, he said, what should be done? Four baboons stepped forward and said, in the capital city of the Ali Empire, there are warriors without number, and their coppersmiths and steel smiths are also to be found. How would it be if we were to buy steel and iron and have those smiths weld weapons for us? A somersault, and Sun Wukong was standing before the city moat. Said he to himself, to first buy the weapons would take a great deal of time. I would rather make magic and take some. So he blew on the ground. Then a tremendous storm wind arose, which drove sand and stones before it and caused all the soldiers in the city to run away in terror. Then Sun Wukong went to the armory, pulled out one of his hairs, turned it into thousands of little apes, cleared out the whole supply of weapons, and flew back home on a cloud. Then he gathered his people about him and counted them. In all, they numbered 77,000. They held the whole mountain in terror and all the magic beasts and spirit princes who dwelt on it. And these came forth from 72 caves and honored Sun Wukong as their head. One day, the ape king said, Now you all have weapons, but this knife which I took from the devil king is too light and no longer suits me. What should be done? Then the four baboons stepped forward and said, Thrisks, in view of your spirit powers, O king, you will find no weapon fit for your use on all the earth. Is it possible for you to walk through the water? The ape king answered, All the elements are subject to me, and there is no place where I cannot go. Then the baboon said, The water at our cave here flows into the great sea to the castle of the Dragon King of the Eastern Sea. If your magic power makes it possible, you could go to the Dragon King and let him give you a weapon. This suited the Ape King. He leaped on the iron bridge and murmured an incantation. Then he flung himself into the waves, which parted before him and ran on till he came to the palace of Water Crystal. There he met a triton who asked who he was. He mentioned his name and said, I am the Dragon King's nearest neighbor and have come to visit him. The Triton took the message to the castle and the Dragon King of the Eastern Sea came out hastily to receive him. He bade him be seated and served him with tea. Sun Wukong said, I have learned the hidden knowledge and gained the powers of immortality. I have drilled my apes in the art of warfare in order to protect our mountain. But I have no weapon I can use and have therefore come to you to borrow one. The Dragon King now had General Flounder bring him a great spear. But Sun Wukong was not satisfied with it. Then he ordered Field Marshal Eel to fetch in a nine-tined fork, which weighed 3,600 pounds. But Sun Wukong balanced it in his hand and said, Too light, too light, too light. Then the Dragon King was frightened and had the heaviest weapon in his armory brought in. It weighed 7,200 pounds. But this was Sen still too light for Sun Wukong. The Dragon King assured him that he had nothing heavier. But Sun Wukong would not give in and said, just look around. Finally, the Dragon Queen and her daughter came out and said to the Dragon King, 
this saint is an unpleasant customer with whom to deal. The great iron bar is still lying here in our sea. And not so long ago, it shone with a red glow, which is probably a sign it is time for it to be taken away, said the Dragon King. But that is the rod which the great Yu used when he ordered the waters and determined the depth of the seas and rivers. It cannot be taken away. The Dragon Queen replied, Just let him see it. What he then does with it is no concern of ours. So the Dragon King led Sun Wukong to the measuring rod. The golden radiance that came from it could be seen some distance off. It was an enormous iron bar with golden clamps on either side. Sun Wukong raised it with the exertion of all his strength and then said, It is too heavy and ought to be somewhat shorter and thinner. No sooner had he said this than the iron rod grew less. He tried it again and then he noticed that it grew larger or smaller at command. It could be made to shrink to the size of a pin. Sun Wu Kung was overjoyed and beat about in the sea with the rod, which he had let grow large again, till the waves spurted mountain high and the dragon castle rocked on its foundations. The dragon king trembled with fright and all his tortoises, fishes, and crabs drew in their heads. Sun Wukong laughed and said, Many thanks for the handsome present. Then he continued, Now I have a weapon, it is true, but as yet I have no armor. Rather than hunt up two or three other households, I think you will be willing to provide me with a suit of mail. The dragon king told him that he had no armor to give him. Then the ape said, I will not leave until you have obtained one for me. And once more, he began to swing his rod. Do not harm me, said the terrified dragon king. I will ask my brothers. And he had them beat the iron drum and strike the golden gong. And in a moment's time, all the dragon king's brothers came from all the other seas. The dragon king talked to them in private and said, This is a terrible fellow, and we must not rouse his anger. First, he took the rod with the golden clamps from me, and now he also insists on having a suit of armor. The best thing to do would be to satisfy him at once and complain of him to the Lord of the Heavens later. So the brothers brought a magic suit of golden mail, magic boots, and a magic helmet. Then Sun Wu Kung thanked them and returned to his cave. Radiantly, he greeted his children, who had come to meet him, and showed them the rod with the golden clamps. They all crowded up and wished to pick it up from the ground, if only a single time but it was just as though a dragonfly had attempted to overthrow a stone column or an ant were trying to carry a great mountain. It would not move a hair's breadth. Then the apes opened their mouths and stuck out their tongues and said, Father, how is it possible for you to carry that heavy thing? So he told them the secret of the rod and showed them its effects. Then he set his empire in order and appointed the four baboons, field marshals, and the seven beast spirits, the ox spirit, the dragon spirit, the bird spirit, the lion spirit, and the rest also joined him. One day he took a nap after dinner. Before he did so, he had let the bar shrink and had stuck it in his ear. While he was sleeping, he saw two men come along in his dream who had a card on which was written, Sun Wukong. They would not allow him to resist, but fettered him and led his spirit away. And when they reached a great city, the ape king gradually came to himself. Over the city gate, he saw a tablet of iron on which was engraved in large letters, the netherworld. Then 
all was suddenly clear to him, and he said, Why, this must be the dwelling place of death. But I have long since escaped from his power, and how dare he have me dragged here. The more he reflected, the wilder he grew. He drew out the golden rod from his ear, swung it, and let it grow large. Then he crushed the two constables to mush, burst his fetters, and rolled his bar before him into the city. The ten princes of the dead were frightened, bowed before him, and asked, Who are you? Sun Wu Kung answered, If you do not know me, then why did you send for me and have me dragged to this place? I am the heaven-born Saint Sun Wu Kung of the Mountain of Flowers and Fruits. And now, who are you? Tell me your names quickly, or I will strike you. The ten princes of the dead humbly gave him their names. Sun Wukong said, I, the venerable son, have gained the power of eternal life. You have nothing to say to me. Quick, let me have the book of life. They did not dare defy him, and had the scribe bring in the book. Sun Wukong opened it. Under the head of apes, number 1350, he read, Sun Wu Kung, the heaven-born stone ape. His years shall be 324. Then he shall die without illness. Sun Wu Kung took the brush from the table and struck out the whole ape family from the Book of Life, threw the book down and said, Now, we are even. From this day on, I will suffer no impertinences from you. With that, he cleared away for himself out of the netherworld by means of his rod, and the ten princes of the dead did not venture to stay him, but only complained of him afterward to the Lord of the heavens. When Sun Wukong had left the city, he slipped and fell to the ground. This caused him to wake, and he noticed he had been dreaming. He called his four baboons to him and said, Splendid, splendid. I was dragged to Death's castle, and I caused considerable uproar there. I had them give me the book of life, and I struck out the mortal hour of all the apes. And after that time, the apes on the mountain no longer died because their names had been stricken out in the netherworld. But the Lord of the Heavens sat in his castle and had all his servants assembled about him. And a saint stepped forward and presented the complaint of the Dragon King of the Eastern Sea. And another stepped forward and presented the complaint of the Ten Princes of the Dead. The Lord of the Heavens glanced through the two memorials. Both told of the wild, unmannerly conduct of Sun Wukong. So the Lord of the Heavens ordered a god to descend to earth and take him prisoner. The evening star came forward, however, and said, This ape was born of the purest powers of heaven and earth and sun and moon. He has gained the hidden knowledge and has become an immortal. Recall, O Lord, your great love for all that which has life, and forgive him his sin. Issue an order that he be called up to the heavens, and be given a charge here, so that he may come to his senses. Then, if he again oversteps your commands, let him be punished without mercy. The Lord of the heavens was agreeable, had the order issued, and told the evening star to take it to Sun Wukong. The evening star mounted a colored cloud and descended on the mountain of flowers and fruits. He greeted Sun Wu Kung and said to him, The Lord had heard of your actions and meant to punish you. I am the evening star of the western skies, and I spoke for you. Therefore, he has commissioned me to take you to the skies, so that you may be given a charge there. Sun Wukong was overjoyed and answered, I had just been thinking I ought to pay heaven a visit sometime. And sure enough, Old Star, 
Here you have come to fetch me. Then he had his four baboons come and said to them impressively, See that you take good care of our mountain. I am going up to the heavens to look around there a little. Then he mounted a cloud together with the evening star and floated up. But he kept turning his somersaults and advanced so quickly that the evening star on his cloud was left behind. Before he knew it, he had reached the southern gate of heaven and was about to step carelessly through. The gatekeeper did not wish to let him enter, but he did not let this stop him. In the midst of their dispute, the evening star came up and explained matters, and then he was allowed to enter the heavenly gate. When he came to the castle of the Lord of the Heavens, he stood upright before it, without bowing his head. The Lord of the Heavens asked, Then this hairy face with the pointed lips is Sun Wukong? He replied, Yes, I am the Venerable Son. All the servants of the Lord of the Heavens were shocked and said, This wild ape does not even bow, and goes so far as to call himself the Venerable Son. His crime deserves a thousand deaths. But the Lord said, He has come up from the earth below, and is not as yet used to our rules. We will forgive him. Then he gave orders that a charge be found for him. The marshal of the heavenly court reported, There is no charge vacant anywhere, but an official is needed in the heavenly stables. Thereupon the Lord made him stable master of the heavenly steeds. Then the servants of the Lord of the heavens told him he should give thanks for the grace bestowed on him. Sun Wukong called out aloud, thanks to command, took possession of his certificate of appointment, and went to the stables in order to enter upon his new office. Sun Wukong attended to his duties with great zeal. The heavenly steeds grew sleek and fat, and the stables were filled with young foals. Before he knew it, half a month had gone by. Then his heavenly friends prepared a banquet for him. While they were at table, Sun Wukong asked accidentally, Stable master? What sort of a title is that? Why, that is an official title, was the reply. What rank has this office? It has no rank at all, was the answer. Ah, said the ape, is it so high that it outranks all other dignities? No, it is not high. It is not high at all, answered his friends. It is not even set down in the official roster, but is quite a subordinate position. All you have to do is to attend to the steeds. If you see to it that they grow fat, you get a good mark. But if they grow thin or ill or fall down, your punishment will be right at hand. Then the ape king grew angry what? They treat me, the venerable son, in such a shameful way. And he started up. On my mountain, I was a king. I was a father. What need was there for him to lure me into his heaven to feed horses? I'll do it no longer. I'll do it no longer. Hola. And he had already overturned the table, drawn the rod with the golden clamps from his ear, let it grow large, and beat a way out for himself to the southern gate of heaven. And no one dared stop him. Already he was back in his island mountain, and his people surrounded him and said, You have been gone for more than ten years, great king. How is it you do not return to us until now? The ape king said, I did not spend more than about ten days in heaven. This Lord of the Heavens does not know how to treat his people. He made me his stable master, and I had to feed his horses. I am so ashamed that I am ready to die. But I did not put up with it, and now I am here once more. His apes 
eagerly prepared a banquet to comfort him. While they sat at table, two horned devil kings came and brought him a yellow imperial robe as a present. Filled with joy, he slipped into it and appointed the two devil kings leaders of the vanguard. They thanked him and began to flatter him. With your power and wisdom, great king, why should you have to serve the Lord of the heavens? To call you the great saint who is heaven's equal would be quite in order. The ape was pleased with the speech and said, Good, good. Then he ordered his four baboons to have a flag made quickly, on which was to be inscribed, The great saint who is heaven's equal. And from that time on, he had himself called by that title. When the Lord of the Heavens learned of the flight of the ape, he ordered Li Tsing, the pagoda-bearing god, and his third son, Nocha, to take the ape king prisoner. They sallied forth at the head of a heavenly warrior host, laid out a camp before his cave, and sent a brave warrior to challenge him to single combat. But he was easily beaten by Sun Wukong and obliged to flee. And Sun Wukong even shouted after him, laughing, What a bag of wind! And he calls himself a heavenly warrior. I'll not slay you. Run along quickly and send me a better man. When Nocha saw this, he himself hurried up to do battle. Said Sun Wukong to him, To whom do you belong, little one? You must not play around here for something might happen to you. But Nocha cried out in a loud voice, A cursed ape, I am Prince Nocha, and have been ordered to take you prisoner. And with that, he swung his sword in the direction of Sun Wukong. Very well, said the latter, I will stand here and never move. Then Nocha grew very angry and turned into a three-headed god with six arms in which he held six different weapons. Thus, he rushed on to the attack. Sun Wukong laughed. The little fellow knows the trick of it, but easy, wait a bit. I will change shape too. And he also turned himself into a figure with three heads and with six arms and swung three gold clamp rods. And thus, they began to fight. Their blows rained down with such rapidity that it seemed as though thousands of weapons were flying through the air. After thirty rounds, the combat had not yet been decided. Then, Sun Wukong hit upon an idea. He secretly pulled out one of his hairs, turned it into his own shape, and let it continue the fight with Nocha. He himself, however, slipped behind Nocha and gave him such a blow on the left arm with his rod that his knees gave way beneath him with pain, and he had to withdraw in defeat. So Nacha told his father, Li Tsing, This devil ape is altogether too powerful. I cannot get the better of him. There was nothing left to do but to return to the heavens and admit their overthrow. The Lord of the Heavens bowed his head, and tried to think of some other hero whom he might send out. Then the evening star once more came forward and said, This ape is so strong and so courageous that probably not one of us here is a match for him. He revolted because the office of stable master appeared too lowly for him. The best thing would be to temper justice with mercy, let him have his way, and appoint him great saint who is heaven's equal. It will only be necessary to give him the empty title without combining a charge with it, and then the matter would be settled. The Lord of the Heavens was satisfied with this suggestion, and once more sent the evening star to summon the new saint. When Sun Wukong heard that he had arrived, he said, The old evening star is a good fellow and he had his army draw up in line to give him a festive reception. He himself donned his robes of ceremony and politely went out to meet him. 
Then the evening star told him what had taken place in the heavens, and that he had his appointment as great saint who is heaven's equal with him. Thereupon the great saint laughed and said, You also spoke in my behalf before, old star, and now you have again taken my part. Many thanks. Many thanks. Then, when they appeared together in the presence of the Lord of the Heavens, the latter said, The rank of great Saint Who is Heaven's equal, is very high. But now, you must not cut any further capers. The great Saint expressed his thanks, and the Lord of the Heavens ordered two skilled architects to build a castle for him, east of the Peach Garden of the Queen Mother of the West. And he was led into it, with all possible honors. Now the saint was in his element. He had all that heart could wish for, and was untroubled by any work. He took his ease, walked about in the heavens as he chose, and paid visits to the gods. The three pure ones and the four rulers he treated with some little respect, but the planetary gods and the lords of the twenty-eight houses of the moon and of the twelve zodiac signs, and the other stars he addressed familiarly with a hey you. Thus he idled day by day, without occupation among the clouds of the heavens. On one occasion, one of the wise said to the Lord of the heavens, The holy sun is idle while day follows day. It is to be feared that some mischievous thoughts may occur to him and it might be better to give him some charge. So the Lord of the Heavens summoned the great saint and said to him, The life-giving peaches in the garden of the Queen Mother will soon be ripe. I give you the charge of watching over them. Do your duty conscientiously. This pleased the saint, and he expressed his thanks. Then he went to the garden the caretakers and gardeners received him on their knees. He asked them, How many trees in all are there in the garden? Three thousand six hundred, replied the gardener. There are twelve hundred trees in the foremost row. They have red blossoms and bear small fruit, which ripens every three thousand years. Whoever eats it grows bright and healthy. The twelve hundred trees in the middle row have double blossoms and bear sweet fruit, which ripens every 6,000 years. Whoever eats of it is able to float in the rose dawn without aging. The 1,200 trees in the last row bear red striped fruit with small pits. They ripen every 9,000 years. Whoever eats their fruit lives eternally, as long as the heavens themselves and remains untouched for thousands of eons. The saint heard all this with pleasure. He checked up the lists, and from that time on appeared every day or so to see to things. The greater part of the peaches in the last row were already ripe. When he came to the garden, he would on each occasion send away the caretakers and gardeners under some pretext leap up into the trees, and gorge himself to his heart's content with the peaches. At that time, the Queen Mother of the West was preparing the great peach banquet, to which she was accustomed to invite all the gods of the heavens. She sent out the fairies in their garments of seven colors with baskets, that they might pick the peaches. The caretaker said to them, The garden has now been entrusted to the guardianship of the great saint, who is heaven's equal, so you will first have to announce yourselves to him. With that, he led the seven fairies into the garden. There they looked everywhere for the great saint, but could not find him. So the fairies said, We have our orders, and must not be late. We will begin picking the peaches in the meantime. So they picked several baskets, full from the foremost row. In the second row, the peaches were already scarcer. And in the 
the last row, there hung only a single half-ripe peach. They bent down the bough and picked it, and then allowed it to fly up again. Now it happened that the great saint, who had turned himself into a peach worm, had just been taking his noonday nap on this bough. When he was so rudely awakened, he appeared in his true form, seized his rod, and was about to strike the fairies. But the fairies said, We have been sent here by the Queen Mother. Do not be angry, great saint, said the great saint. And who are all those whom the Queen Mother has invited? They answered, All the gods and saints in the heavens, on the earth and under the earth. Has she also invited me, said the saint. Not that we know of, said the fairies. Then the saint grew angry, murmured a magic incantation, and said, Stay, stay. With that, the seven fairies were banned to the spot. The saint then took a cloud and sailed away on it to the palace of the queen mother. On the way, he met the barefoot god and asked him, Where are you going? To the peach banquet, was the answer. Then the saint lied to him, saying, I have been commanded by the Lord of the heavens to tell all the gods and saints that they are first to come to the hall of purity in order to practice the rites and then go together to the queen mother. Then the great saint changed himself into the semblance of the barefoot god and sailed to the palace of the queen mother. There he let his cloud sink down and entered quite unconcerned. The meal was ready, yet none of the gods had as yet appeared. Suddenly, the great saint caught the aroma of wine and saw well nigh a hundred barrels of the precious nectar standing in a room to one side. His mouth watered. He tore a few hairs out and turned them into sleepworms. These worms crept into the nostrils of the cupbearers so that they all fell asleep. Thereupon, he enjoyed the delicious viands to the full, opened the barrels, and drank until he was nearly stupefied. Then he said to himself, This whole affair is beginning to make me feel creepy. I had better go home first of all, and sleep a bit. And he stumbled out of the garden with uncertain steps. Sure enough, he missed his way and came to the dwelling of Lao Tse. There he regained consciousness. He arranged his clothing and went in. There was no one to be seen in the place, for at the moment Lao Tse was at the God of Light's abode, talking to him, and with him were all his servants, listening. Since he found no one at home, the great saint went as far as the inner chamber, where Lao Tse was in the habit of brewing the elixir of life. Beside the stove stood five gourd containers full of the pills of life which had already been rolled. Said the great saint, I had long since intended to prepare a couple of these pills, so it suits me very well to find them here. He poured out the contents of the gourds and ate up all the pills of life. Since he had now had enough to eat and drink, he thought to himself, Bad, bad. The mischief I have done cannot well be repaired. If they catch me, my life will be in danger. I think I had better go down to earth again and remain a king. With that, he made himself invisible, went out at the western gate of heaven, and returned to the mountain of flowers and fruits, where he told his people who received him the story of his adventures. When he spoke of the wine nectar of the peach garden, his ape said, Can't you go back once more and steal a few bottles of the wine, so that we too may taste of it and gain eternal life? The ape king was willing, turned a somersault, crept into the garden unobserved, and picked up four more barrels. Two of them he took under his arms, and two he held in his hands. Then he disappeared with them without leaving a trace, 
and brought them to his cave, where he enjoyed them together with his apes. In the meantime, the seven fairies, whom the great saint had banned to the spot, had regained their freedom after a night and a day. They picked up their baskets and told the Queen Mother what had happened to them. And the cupbearers, too, came hurrying up and reported the destruction which someone unknown had caused among the eatables and drinkables. The Queen Mother went to the Lord of the Heavens to complain. Shortly afterward, Lotsi also came to him to tell about the theft of the pills of life, and the barefoot god came along and reported that he had been deceived by the great saint, who is heaven's equal. And from the great saint's palace, the servants came running and said that the saint had disappeared and was nowhere to be found. Then the lord of the heavens was frightened and said, this whole mess is undoubtedly the work of that devilish ape. Now the whole host of heaven, together with all the star gods, the time gods, and the mountain gods, was called out in order to catch the ape. Li Tsing once more was its commander-in-chief. He invested the entire mountain and spread out the sky net and the earth net so that no one could escape. Then he sent his bravest heroes into battle. Courageously, the ape withstood all attacks from early morn till sundown. But by that time, his most faithful followers had been captured. That was too much for him. He pulled out a hair and turned it into thousands of ape kings, who all hewed about them with golden-clamped iron rods. The heavenly host was vanquished, and the ape withdrew to his cave to rest. Now it happened that Guan Yin had also gone to the peach banquet in the garden and had found out what Sun Wukong had done. When she went to visit the Lord of the Heavens, Li Tsing was just coming in to report the great defeat which he had suffered on the mountain of flowers and fruits. Then Guan Yin said to the Lord of the Heavens, I can recommend a hero to you who will surely get the better of the ape. It is your grandson, Yang Erlang. He has conquered all the beast and bird spirits and overthrown the elves in the grass and the brush. He knows what has to be done to get the better of such devils. So Yang Erlang was brought in and Li Tsing led him to his camp. Li Tsing asked young Erlang how he would go about getting the better of the ape. Young Erlang laughed and said, I think I will have to go him one better when it comes to changing shapes. It would be best for you to take away the sky net so that our combat is not disturbed. Then he requested Li Tsing to post himself in the upper air with the magic spirit mirror in his hand so that when the ape made himself invisible, he might be found again by means of the mirror. When all this had been arranged, young Erlang went out in front of the cave with his spirits to give battle. The ape leaped out, and when he saw the powerful hero with the three tined sword standing before him, he asked, And who may you be? The other said, I am young Erlang the grandson of the Lord of the Heavens. Then the ape laughed and said, Oh yes, I remember. His daughter ran away with a certain Sir Yang, to whom heaven gave a son. You must be that son. Young Erlang grew furious and advanced upon him with his spear. Then a hot battle began. For three hundred rounds, they fought without decisive results. Then... Young Erlang turned himself into a giant with a black face and red hair. Not bad, said the ape, but I can do that too. So they continued to fight in that form. But the ape's baboons were much frightened. The beast and planet spirits of young Erlang pressed the apes hard. They slew most of them, and the others hid away. 
the ape saw this, his heart grew uneasy. He drew the magic giant likeness in again, took his rod, and fled. But young Erlang followed hard on his heels. In his urgent need, the ape thrust the rod, which he had turned into a needle, into his ear, turned into a sparrow, and flew up into the crest of a tree. Young Erlang, who was following in his tracks, suddenly lost sight of him. But his keen eyes soon recognized that he had turned himself into a sparrow. So he flung away spear and crossbow, turned himself into a sparrow hawk, and darted down on the sparrow. But the latter soared high into the air as a cormorant. Young Erlang shook his plumage, turned into a great sea crane, and shot up into the clouds to seize the cormorant. The latter dropped, flew into a valley, and dove beneath the waters of a brook in the guise of a fish. When young Erlang reached the edge of the valley and had lost his trail, he said to himself, This ape has surely turned himself into a fish or a crab. I will change my form as well in order to catch him. So he turned into a fish hawk and floated above the surface of the water. When the ape in the water caught sight of the fish hawk, he saw that he was young Erlang. He swiftly swung around and fled, young Erlang, in pursuit. When the latter was no further away than the length of a beak, the ape turned, crept ashore as a water snake, and hid in the grass. Young Erlang, when he saw the water snake creep from the water, turned into an eagle and spread his claws to seize the snake. But the water snake sprang up and turned into the lowest of all birds, a speckled buzzard, and perched on the steep edge of a cliff. When young Erlang saw that the ape had turned himself into so contemptible a creature as a buzzard, he would no longer play the game of changing form with him. He reappeared in his original form, took up his crossbow, and shot at the bird. The buzzard slipped and fell down the side of the cliff. At its foot, the ape turned himself into the chapel of a field god. He opened his mouth for a gate. His teeth became the two wings of the door, his tongue the image of the god, and his eyes the windows. His tail was the only thing he did not know what to do with, so he let it stand up stiffly behind him in the shape of a flagpole. When young Erlang reached the foot of the hill, he saw the chapel, whose flagpole stood in the rear. Then he laughed and said, That ape is really a devil of an ape. He wants to lure me into the chapel in order to bite me. But I will not go in. First, I will break his windows for him, and then I will stamp down the wings of his door. When the ape heard this, he was much frightened. He made a bound like a tiger and disappeared without a trace in the air. With a single somersault, he reached young Erlang's own temple. There, he assumed young Erlang's own form and stepped in. The spirits who were on guard were unable to recognize him. They received him on their knees. So the ape then seated himself on the god's throne and had the prayers which had come in submitted to him. When young Erlang no longer saw the ape, he rose in the air to lead Sing and said, I was vying with the ape in changing shape. Suddenly, I could no longer find him. Take a look in the mirror. Li to Sing took a look in the magic spirit mirror, and then he laughed and said, The ape has turned himself into your likeness, is sitting in your temple quite at home there, and making mischief. When young Erlang heard this, he took his three-tined spear and hastened to his temple. The door spirits were frightened and said, But father came in only this very minute. How is it that another one comes now? Young Erlang, without paying attention to them, entered the temple 
and aimed his spear at Sun Wukong. The latter resumed his own shape, laughed, and said, Young sir, you must not be angry. The god of this place is now Sun Wukong. Without uttering a word, young Erlang assailed him. Sun Wukong took up his rod and returned the blows. Thus, they crowded out of the temple together, fighting and wrapped in mists and clouds, once more gained the mountain of flowers and fruits. In the meantime, Guan Yin was sitting with Lao Tse, the Lord of the Heavens, and the Queen Mother in the Great Hall of Heaven, waiting for news. When none came, she said, I will go with Lao Tse to the southern gate of heaven and see how matters stand. And when they saw that the struggle had still not come to an end, she said to Lao Tse, How would it be if we helped young Erlang a little? I will shut up Sun Wukong in my vase. But Lao Tse said, Your vase is made of porcelain. Sun Wukong could smash it with his iron rod. But I have a circlet of diamonds which can enclose all living creatures. That we can use. So he flung his circlet through the air from the heavenly gate and struck Sun Wukong on the head with it. Since he had his hands full fighting, the latter could not guard himself against it, and the blow on the forehead caused him to slip. Yet he rose again and tried to escape. But the heavenly hound of young Erlang bit his leg until he fell to the ground. Then young Erlang and his followers came up and tied him with thongs and thrust a hook through his collarbone so that he could no longer transform himself. And Lao Tzu took possession of his diamond circlet again and returned with Guan Yin to the Hall of Heaven. Sun Wukong was now brought in in triumph and was condemned to be beheaded. He was then taken to the place of execution and bound to a post. But all efforts to kill him by means of axe and sword, thunder and lightning were vain. Nothing so much as hurt a hair on his head, said Lao Tse. It is not surprising. This ape has eaten the peaches, has drunk the nectar also swallowed the pills of life. Nothing can harm him. The best thing would be for me to take him along and thrust him into my stove in order to melt the elixir of life out of him again. Then he will fall into dust and ashes. So Sun Wukong's fetters were loosed, and Lao Tse took him with him, thrust him into his oven, and ordered the boy to keep up a hot fire. But along the edge of the oven were graven the signs of the eight elemental forces. And when the ape was thrust into the oven, he took refuge beneath the sign of the wind, so that the fire could not injure him, and the smoke only made his eyes smart. He remained in the oven seven times seven days. Then Lao Tzu had it opened to take a look. As soon as Sun Wukong saw the light shine in, he could no longer bear to be shut up, but leaped out and upset the magic oven. The guards and attendants he threw to the ground, and Lao Tse himself, who tried to seize him, received such a push that he stuck his legs up in the air like an onion turned upside down. Then Sun Wukong took his rod out of his ear, and without looking where he struck, hewed everything to bits, so that the star gods closed their doors, and the guardians of the heavens ran away. He came to the castle of the lord of the heavens, and the guardian of the gate, with his steel whip, was only just in time to hold him back. Then the thirty-six thunder gods were set at him, and surrounded him, though they could not seize him. The lord of the heavens said, Buddha will know what is to be done. Send for him quickly. So Buddha came up out of the west with Ananada and Kashyapa, his disciples. When he saw the turmoil, he said, First of all, 
let weapons be laid aside and let out the saint. I wish to speak with him. The gods withdrew. Sun Wukong snorted and said, Who are you who dare to speak to me? Buddha smiled and replied, I have come out of the blessed west, Shakyamuni Amitofu. I have heard of the revolt you have raised, and am come to tame you, said Sun Wukong. I am the stone ape who has gained the hidden knowledge. I am master of seventy-two transformations, and will live as long as heaven itself. What has the Lord of the heavens accomplished that entitles him to remain eternally on his throne? Let him make way for me, and I will be satisfied. Buddha replied with a smile. You are a beast which has gained magic powers. How can you expect to rule here as Lord of the Heavens? Be it known to you that the Lord of the Heavens has toiled for eons in perfecting his virtues. How many years would you have to pass before you could attain the dignity he has gained? And then I must ask you whether there is anything else you can do aside from playing your tricks of transformation. Said Sun Wukong, I can turn cloud somersaults. Each one carries me 18,000 miles ahead. Surely that is enough to entitle me to be the Lord of the Heavens. Buddha answered with a smile. Let us make a wager. If you can so much as leave my hand with one of your somersaults, then I will beg the Lord of the Heavens to make way for you. But if you are not able to leave my hand, then you must yield yourself to my fetters. Sun Wukong suppressed his laughter, for he thought, This Buddha is a crazy fellow. His hand is not a foot long. How could I help but leap out of it? So he opened his mouth wide and said, Agreed. Buddha then stretched out his right hand. It resembled a small lotus leaf. Sun Wukong leaped up into it with one bound. Then he said, Go. And with that, he turned one somersault after another, so that he flew along like a whirlwind. And while he was flying along, he saw five tall, reddish columns towering to the skies. Then he thought, That is the end of the world. Now I will turn back and become Lord of the Heavens. But first, I will write down my name to prove that I was there. He pulled out a hair, turned it into a brush, and wrote with great letters on the middle column, The Great Saint Who is Heaven's Equal. Then he turned his somersaults again, until he had reached the place whence he had come. He leaped down from the Buddha's hand, laughing, and said, Now hurry, and see to it, that the Lord of the Heavens clears his heavenly castle for me. I have been at the end of the world and have left a sign there. Buddha scolded. Infamous ape! How dare you claim that you have left my hand? Take a look and see whether or not the great Saint Who is Heaven's equal is written on my middle finger. Sun Wukong was terribly frightened for at the first glance, he saw that this was the truth. Yet outwardly, he pretended that he was not convinced, said he would take another look, and tried to make use of the opportunity to escape. But Buddha covered him with his hand, shoved him out of the gate of heaven, and formed a mountain of water, fire, wood, earth, and metal, which he softly set down on him, to hold him fast. A magic incantation pasted on the mountain prevented his escape. Here he was obliged to lie for hundreds of years, until he finally reformed and was released, in order to help the monk of the Yangtze Kyang fetch the holy writings from out of the West. He honored the monk as his master, and thenceforward was known as the Wanderer. Guan Yin who had released him, gave the monk a golden circlet. Sun Wukong was induced to put it on, 
and it at once grew into his flesh, so that he could not remove it. And Guan Yin gave the monk a magic formula, by means of which the ring could be tightened, should the ape grow disobedient. But from that time on, he was always polite and well-mannered. The End Thank you for taking the time to listen along with me this evening. I hope this has helped to relax you, and that you have enjoyed the story. If there are any stories you would like to hear in the future, please leave a comment in the section below. And please consider subscribing, so that you won't miss out on all the stories coming to the channel very soon. And until next time, goodbye for now.